Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 28. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante here, extracting the signal from the industry, sharing it with you, Dave. Hey, great John. To see you. Great to see you. Awesome. Oh, uh, episode 28. You know, it's, it feels like the past two weeks have been incredible. It's almost like a lull before the storm again with the cube. A lot of action happening. I just can't believe um, the AI stuff has continued to to, to blossom, um, and huge amount of tech. Um, stories. Arms IPO has been announced. Everyone's going crazy on that. I really want to get your thoughts on that because you you delved into it. It was a week of uh, uh, Silicon Valley and San Francisco intrigue because two things happened. San Francisco was like a ghost town because everyone got stuck at Burning Man. So that happened. Muddy Man. So it was, uh, <laughs> I call it Drowning Man. Um, a lot of, lot of antitrust. Amazon got sued by your friend Lena Khan. Um, the cloud wars happen. We're kind of still reeling in the post two killer, killer events that just happened in the industry. One was the VMware Explorer and Google Nest. I know we talked about it in the last pod, but the, the the impact of those events are still happening. One, VMware and Broadcom, that saga continues because apparently everyone was supposed to get their letters, uh, that whether they're going to get fired or not. And apparently only the VPs got their letters, not the employees. They're going to get them later, probably right before the uh, August. October. What letters? The, 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 your, your fired letters or you're staying? I reported on the cube at VMware Explorer exclusive content that we had data and insiders telling us that um, everyone was going to get notified by Friday, right. November that. 1st. Right. Okay. So we were right, but wrong. The only, they only notified VP. So as of right now, the v, the VPs at VMware know whether they're staying or going. Okay, so they got right. notified like stay or go. It's yeah. kind of binary. Not not if yeah, you get yeah. a letter, you stay, or if you get a letter, you're gone. It's like some yeah. stay, some go. Yeah. So everybody yeah, knows and, now the VP level. Yeah. yeah, they know the VP level knows, and then so that's going to trickle down. So, so there's less this. VPs now at VMware. Well, there will be. I don't know the timetable on the exit. I don't have that much information because they're tight-lipped about it. And, and, you know, I really don't want to amplify it. It's, it's, it's a gutting and it's sad. And VMware is a great yeah, company. Sucks, so but, there yeah. are our friends over there. We love VMware. I mean, they're a juggernaut in, in the enterprise. And, you know, and, and like I said, they're, the chapter is closed. The new chapter will emerge. And and it's, it's and they'll do good with it. I mean, you know, yeah. VMware will do good at Broadcom. But, but it's a crown jewel for Broadcom on top of CA and all their other business. They've got Symantec, CA. I know some folks over there that are doing great work. So a lot of stuff going on there. Google Next um, created a lot of buzz around our content around developer first. We call it the AI developer, the AI cloud. A lot of feedback on Twitter, a lot of feedback on the industry, because now Amazon is, is really leaning into, you're starting to see their moves. Uh, and you can almost get a feel that Amazon reInvent um, is in the air, that they're going to do some great stuff there. So a ton of stuff going on at reInvent. They're going to have the last lot. word of the year on AI. So... <laughs> yeah. we'll see we'll it's like, see it's like the last closing argument the you know the <laughs> lawyer gets to close <laughs> i think i i think you're going to see a lot more andy jassy involved in in um, that other news um, well did you see and, that that he's like drafted um dave brown you you know these guys better than i do swami did you see yeah. that yeah, then the, he's, um, he's expanded his team, his senior leadership team, yeah. to include those guys. That was yeah, an they, interesting move. They call it the S team, and the S team is the senior of Amazon proper. Yeah, all, all our all our guys are in that we know from Amazon. You know, um, Dave Brown, Matt Garman, now Swami, um, and then Mike they got the, the Robo Tax unit is in there too. Look at Andy Jassy, smart. Okay, and he he has integrity. He gets the market. He's pretty smart, and I think you're going to see some moves um, from Amazon. Then you're saying acquisition. That's the easy thing to, to give a hot take on. But Amazon and Amazon Web Services will unify. I think Amazon is a little bit behind Google in the sense of what Sundar Pakai did with the code bread. And remember, we reported this on our, one of our earlier pods. I think it was on our, in our first view. Well, remember the code red from Google. Google ordered the code red, meaning, hey, guys, we're getting killed by ChatGPT and the public opinion and, and OpenAI and Microsoft, a.k.a. number two cloud, and we're the number three cloud. Since that moment, Google has absolutely mobilized and across the company. It's almost as if it doesn't matter which department you're in. They brought their AI jewels to the table, and they're putting it out there, and they're starting to see the fruit bearing off that tree from the code red story. Since that time... Google's now has a clear roadmap and they feel unified. 
Amazon is right behind them. And I think Amazon's code red moment probably happened after Google, after they got kicked to the curb and kicked in the teeth about being late to the game, which is not true. We've reported that many times. Amazon and Amazon has great leadership in data, AI, and all that. But they're kind of like quirky culture, as you know, in a good way. They probably said, ah, it's going to blow over. We'll work backwards from the customers. And then like, oh, my God, this is actually legit. We could actually get taken down a peg. And I guarantee you, Andy Jassy and Adam Selesky and team said, what, why are we taking punches on this? Let's just go out there and kick some ass. So I think that happened. So if that happened, the question is, can they get their story out fast enough, Dave, for reInvent? Can Amazon show the market that they got the goods? We'll see. 100%. I mean, uh, come on. They, they're not going to blow reInvent. You know, they, <laughs> we'll they, see. We'll I mean, see. if they blow reInvent, holy cow. I mean, that if, will be, if that they will don't, be a disaster. If they don't hit the home run at reInvent in this market, and by the way, you know, the GPU competition is high. People want GPUs. It is a growing, hungry market for GPUs. Google's got TPUs. Amazon's got their chips, the Inferenza, all that good stuff. Um, and and so the question is, will they bring it out? And can they get it out? And, you know, a lot of the skeptics are throwing uh, water on on Amazon, throwing shade on Amazon Web Service. Don't think, and I think they're going to do it. I mean, you know, I don't have any inside information yet. I'm still digging around. We'll find out. We'll have an exclusive with Adam. But just knowing the company for, for over a decade, I mean, Dave, we've got 10 years of reinvent coverage this reinvent where we'll be there the cube will be there in force by the way but not on the floor is our 11th year i can tell you that i expect them to have something pretty good you can connect the dots here you're going to see some high performance compute and gpu um, support you're going to see the data story become clear and the wild card is going to be what the ecosystem does can the ecosystem go the next level. And I've been very critical of Amazon's ecosystem um, being monetized at these events, as you know. So we'll see. Um, I think Amazon has to have a pro ecosystem move uh, to continue that momentum as number one, as the number one player. So, you know, uh, it's, it's it's too early in the game to say they're going to blow their lead to make the playoffs, if you will, as, as we always say in, about the Red Sox and, and Patriots. Yeah, well, uh, Red Sox aren't looking so good. <laughs> and the Patriots are going to get crushed tomorrow <laughs> or when it's Sunday. But it's, it's football it's, season. It's the Philadelphia yeah. Eagles. Oh my God, it's going to be ugly. Did you get in the pool? I got I got in the Silicon Angle pool. Did you get in? I don't get invited. They don't, they don't want me in there. I won it last year, you know. You did? I did. I don't get an invitation. The boys don't invite me in. Why? And I mean, so, you're, you're uh, love I, I, I won it last year. I, I did well last night. My guy got 19 points. I, so I was that was good. <laughs> did you see that? Um, did you see that Nielsen's not going to report that discrepancy data that Amazon had on on Thursday night football? Amazon no. Amazon claimed that um, Nielsen was way undercounting the viewership for Thursday night football, and they're like, "Look, we'll give you our data. We got better data than you do." And Nielsen's like, "Okay, that's cool." Well, the other networks complained. They're like, "No fucking way! You can publish that data. It's too soon because it's." <laughs> Those, so it's Thursday night football, like having, you know, a bigger share and That's, using, it's called using the internet Amazon data. data. Well, exactly. It's the internet. Exactly. You can measure everything. And so, and of course that's going to boost advertising, you know, rates. And so the other networks complained about it. So Nielsen shut it down. So that yeah. was kind of interesting. That would be a big win for Amazon. It's almost as if the truth is out there and everyone's making money on the lie, AKA Nielsen ratings. So why unveil the truth and level the playing field against the the um, people using fake data. I mean, Nielsen is fake data. Everybody knows that. So yeah, like, I think they kind of even admitted like, it. But I, so I didn't see Thursday night football last night. I was working late, but I like Thursday night football. I think it's got, they got a cool vibe. Amazon does some interesting, the, the stats are great. I mean, it's kind of overload on Thursday night, but, but it's good. I mean, the format is really good. So. Well, I thought, I thought, uh, you know, last night was not a prime, a prime game. It was an NBC kickoff. But I interviewed this week the CISO from Prime Video. Um, and that was amazing. That's going to be part of our Amazon startup showcase that's going to be airing next week. Uh, we got 10 startups, as you know, featuring them. And he's the CISO of um, um, Prime Video. And I brought up the um, 
story about the CISO from the NFL. When we were at Cisco Live, we did that story. We met her and she talked about the hacking the scoreboards. Yeah. And I asked them. I asked, so them cool. I, I asked them and he goes, yeah, they're concerned about um, when because the, they travel with their with the prime team. Amazon uh, uh, Prime's NFL coverage is awesome. That's the, it's unique. Everyone went stu in studio to remote crews. Amazon does the studio on the road with with the crew. So I was interested from the CISO's perspective, among all the other things that they do, what that looked like from a security standpoint, because again, this is like an IoT device. They got a full, tr all the trucks, they got to run cables, got the cameras. And the bottom line is, is that you can hack that stuff. So they are very, they're at the firmware level. So he, he asked, he answered the question. He went into great detail around the security around Thursday night football because they travel to the next city. So it's like basically a, a move. It's a role. It's a, a moving factory. Um, and so I was really curious and, and I thought that was fascinating. Um, and then I asked them about um, how they're integrating in on these platforms with other things. I don't know if you have used prime, but prime has yeah, got, you know, M MGM, MGM plus relationships. So that to, to me and YouTube, by the way, YouTube TV is doing a great job on this, by the way, if you follow the streaming platforms, Whoever can integrate best, best with the billings will win. Because one of the things I hate about streaming is I want to watch another program and then I got a context switch and it takes seconds to it's load. Horrible. I, for, I forgot the password. That's why you YouTube's know. so great. Right? It's, I got, get, I, it's got a I, lot wanted, of content. I wanted to watch the game last night. I could have actually gone to YouTube via the main channel, but I, I, was on, I was in my NFL app because I thought it was on the NFL. I scanned the barcode and boom, I'm in YouTube TV. It instantly cross connected me to YouTube TV. So, so check it that, out. So that, that was amazing. And that way, is that's amazing. called, that's integration. So, so cable, I don't know about your cable, but spectrum, they no more ESPN, ESPN, ESPN two, ESPN classic, all the ESPNs, yeah. you can't get them anymore. Same with Disney, right? Yeah. And they're saying, here's the phone number to call to complain. I'm like, no, <laughs> I said to Deb. Go for it, because she's been trying to cancel cable forever. But I'm like, it's ESPN. Now ESPN's gone. I'm like, cancel cable. Get rid of it. <laughs> and yeah, YouTube TV's awesome, right? Well, Disney Disney had a huge issue with, with Charlie. It was a stalemate on the contract negotiations. Um, huge issue. And and I think basically video broadcast is, is, is struggling. This is the war between streaming, Dave. This is this is what we this is our world now, digital TV. But you're talking um, about your, your point about the user experience is right on. Whoever does the integration and eliminates that context switching, they're gonna be able to charge a premium. And that experience is gonna be really, you know, that's gonna be really important. It's just because <laughs> it's Big change is coming, right? And then, and then, you know, I got Roku's, some Roku's, and some of my TVs, and that's. But, you know, that is that that's a dead end, right? Because all these internet TVs now do everything that yeah. Roku does. I mean, I mean, the thing about the ESPN thing is, I mean, the question is the power. ESPN has so much power. The question is, will your phone calls even matter, and do they even care? So presently, ESPN spends roughly about nine billion a year on sports rights. Yeah. That, um, and, and, you know, now they, have, and this is before they have to pony up for the new rights for the NBA and the new rights for college football. That's 45 billion in sports rights fees through 2027. Yeah. Dave, so 45 billion dollars. So I'm not calling ESPN. I'm calling Spectrum to cancel. Forget it. I don't need you anymore. I need a, I need inter, internet in. That's it. I need, you know, high speed internet. Give me good, good download upload speed. That's it. The rest of the stuff, or, forget it. Or, I don't need it. I mean, this is why I think the whole college football misalignment, that was other big news that happened that we didn't talk about last pod, was the Pac-12 just dis dis disintegrated. And now Stanford and Cal, the schools here in the East West Coast, in my area, Palo Alto, the rivals, they're now in the ACC, which is Duke, North Carolina, Boston College. <laughs> I mean, it, it's like they got to fly across the it's country. Ridiculous. I know. All, be all because of the money. The question is, with cable and the 45 billion that ESPN has got to pony up, Disney's looking at the numbers. They're saying, Hey, wait a minute. Why don't we just go uh, streaming? Why should I even deal with the charter deal? In the old days, they never would have had that leverage. The leverage would have been the cable company. So there's a huge push and the same thing's going on with the actor strike right now. A lot of these uh, Hollywood guys who are middle, middle of the road, they have podcasts going comedians, actors, they're kicking ass on the direct media 
Um, and that's interesting. Yet the writers and in, in media are all, all go all go all the talents go into Substack. So, you know, Disney, um, you know, Disney and Charter is going to open up the door for other cable potentially to to crash too. I mean, look at Comcast, you know, Xfinity. It's going, to, Dave. We're living in very interesting times. I mean, you know, Hollywood versus say traditional media, almost opposites, right? Happening. Spotify has news that their podcast venture, a billion dollars, is kind of going south, not doing well. Um, you know, interesting there. Mm -hmm. Spotify, you know, had had this podcasting network. They spent a million dollars, but you know, they're, they're, the, the subscriptions are up. Ads aren't working. Hey, ads don't work in podcasting. That one interstitial brought to you by, I guess that doesn't scale. But apparently, I love podcasting, as you know. I'm, I'm biased. So. The title is The Hottest Coach in Sports, Coach Prime. So Deion Sanders is the coach of the Colorado University Buffaloes. He came from uh, Jackson State, and we had a great record at Jackson State. This team was 1-11 last year, and they just beat TCU, who went to the national championship. They got smoked by, by, by uh, uh, Georgia Tech, but they, but they, they beat uh, the number two team in the country last year. He comes in. His kid plays QB. And he's got his mojo going. He says, I'm bringing my, my, my baggage, bringing my luggage, and it's Louis, as in Louis Vuitton. So, and he calls, calls his leaders dogs, and he's got these guys going. This is a guy, a lot of people don't like him. I, I got to tell you a quick story. Marion Campbell was the coach in 1989 of the Atlanta Falcons and when Dion's rookie year, game one. They, they quoted him. Up in the booth, the broadcast booth, Marion Campbell saying that Deion Sanders is the greatest athlete I've ever seen. Asked for a comment, Deion responded, "That's accurate. <laughs> this guy has balls, and I love him, and I wish him luck. I, I can't wait to see it. And I just the last thing is in 1989, I was at the CU Colorado, uh, uh, the CU Nebraska game, rooting for Colorado. A friend of mine went there, my college roommate's brother, and." That, to your point, is like they're no longer in the same division. I don't know. They blew up, you know, the division that those guys were both in for years. It used to be a big rivalry. So maybe it'll come back. Colorado, they were in the Pac-12 for a while. So, Pac-12, you know, yeah, right. I mean, we'll see. And Nebraska was I'm, in there too, right? Nebraska, Oklahoma, yeah. right? I mean, Boulder's full of electricity right now. You got you to gotta be pumped for Deion Sanders, you know, um, beating a team that was in the national championship. Obviously, huge. His son, they're already talking Heisman potential. The team is rocking. I mean, it's early. Yeah. I know. I mean, but that guy played, Deion Sanders played 188 games over, I think, 14 seasons. That guy yeah. showed up and he got two rings. Prime time. Prime time. He put, Prime he put, time. His, put his money where his mouth is. Well, Dave, I mean, we got a lot going on in tech again, um, earnings, but, you know, Apple's come out with a new iPhone, you know. So you're seeing uh, the iPhone 15 potentially coming out. And a big event. What version of iPhone do you have now? I don't even you, know. Uh, I have, you know what? Uh, either the latest my, one or. My, no, my phone died last December. I was going to the Palo Alto Network show. So I tried to get the latest. What is it? The 14 is the latest. The one with a good camera. See, I only have the two, the two cameras. And so this is all they had. And my phone wouldn't keep a charge. So I said, ah, fuck it. I'll just give me what you got. So. You know, it's fine. It doesn't have the good camera. It doesn't have the, what do you call the little notch there? I don't have the notch. Yeah, but I, maybe another one. But I have the fatty, like the big one. You used to have the big one, the fab. No, I, I, I know. I have the, I have the biggest one. I like, I like the fatty, but I, but I, I got too. this shitty camera. And, and a I new one. I don't have the Wait notch. for the 15th. So wait for the 15th. They got the big September 12th um, event. It's, uh, they're calling it Wonderlust. Yeah. I hate though. I hate every time I get a new phone. It's like you can't log into any of your apps. You got to re-sign in. Forgot password. It's such a pain in the ass. Yeah. Not worth it. You know. I'll wait till a Apple just does its planned obsolescence and forces me to get another one. So um, random news. So Teresa Carlson took a job at Flexport. She's a Cube alumni, former AWS. Yeah, loved she Teresa. went to Flexport to join the CEO there, Dave Clark, former Amazon ran retail. He steps down, so to speak, sets down. And that's the founder, Ryan Peterson, comes back as a chairman. They already refreshed the website. They got rid of Carlson. So David Clark and his lieutenants are all gone. 
the founder comes back and then David Clark says he's running for governor in Texas. Okay. Right. Um, Teresa, I texted her yesterday and try to get a comment, no comment from her, but she obviously finds out today she's no longer on the website. So Ryan Peterson made it clear that, that he's come back to make the growth work. So, you know, a lot of finger pointing, obviously, you know, the exit, you know, I'm going to change, I'm going to go to politics. He didn't, obviously he got fired. He got bored, basically took him out. Um, but, you know, the market for the, some of these big companies are that overextended have to grow. So they're bringing the founder back, which, you know, and by the way, Dave Clark was totally complimentary. They could probably get a lot of shares. You know, when times are tight, it's great to have the founders around. And this is something that the press and doesn't get it. And then even the VCs don't have this orientation because they like to bounce founders out. I can tell you from firsthand experience. The founders come back because when you got to pivot, you got to make changes. You need the founders energy and execution skills and creativity to make it happen. So Ryan Peterson is coming back to Flexport. Um, Amazon guys came in, team came in to essentially scale it up at the cadence of, you know, Amazon law, if you will, you know, Amazon is get it going, you know, work back from the customer. They did that, but they overspent and now they got to grow. So the founder came in to, to accelerate that and they got rid of the, the lieutenants of which one of them was Teresa Carlson, um, a friend of the cube. So, you know, I'm sure she's going to have a job. I wouldn't be surprised if she jumps back and if Andy Jesse doesn't call up and get her back at the Amazon. Yeah, she you think? Was, I mean, sure, if I, if I, were, I mean, I, I would hire, if I were a company, I'd hire as a CEO, woman CEO, power player, great yeah. salesperson, great the problem, manager. The, here's, the, here's the problem. She's so strong as a leader. She needs to be in a culture that actually rewards that. And I think, you know, she left Amazon. She went to Splunk. They went sideways and then they're kind of going the private equity route or have a new CEO um, left she there. Go to Microsoft she went to Microsoft a little bit to kind of play the field there. Probably didn't want to sign up for a big number there. Joined Flexport, which looked like a great gig because former Amazonian Dave Clark, you no, know, you know, in the family, so to speak, that he gets bounced out. So, you know, I think for Rach, Teresa, she's going to be on a rocket ship with great people. And, you know, this is the classic thing. And I think if she goes back to Amazon, they could use her right now because they had a lot of turnover in the ranks there. And her DNA of Amazon DNA would add massive value. And she would instantly be, be able to step in as a leader in there immediately. And so the question is, can she work with her former colleagues? That's the kind of thing's going to come up. But I think Andy Jassy should bring her back in. And they call that boomeranging. Yeah, as I was gonna say, boomeranging would be a very positive sign. Yeah. Um, my, my opinion, that would be a real plus, you know? Yeah. So um, I, that, that, I just find the founder, that whole founder thing is going on right now. So in the, in this market here in Silicon Valley and around the circles, there's two types of companies. One's the, the AI, company, AI companies that are growing, mostly younger demographic founders. And then the founders of the SaaS companies that are either about to go public or on the verge of public offerings. And then ones that aren't making it. And the ones that aren't making it are going to probably not make it if the founders don't stay around. And, and statistically, it's proven. Companies that are more successful, the ones where the founders stay around. Yeah, not necessarily run the company, but but are there. Yeah, to make right. it happen. So I liked about Frank Slootman's book. He, he, he said, I always celebrate the founders. And you've seen that. He did that with, with Data Domain, with ServiceNow, with you know, Fred Luddy, and now with Snowflake with Benoit and Thierry, you know, he re reveres the founders, treats them with respect, which is, that's the way it should be. You know, it's like, you know, let me run the operations and let me, let me handle the board. You guys do your thing, do your product thing. You know, there's very few, very few founders that actually, you know, have made like super successful CEOs, obviously Michael Dell, Bill Gates, Larry Ellison. I mean, there's definitely more than a handful. Yeah, but, I mean, the founders, the state, well, the one, Google, for instance, they had brought Eric Schmidt in, uh, but they stayed up there. Zuckerberg, yep. he stayed in charge. Uh, Hewlett Packard, their founder, stayed in charge. You know, I think the, the, it, Steve Jobs I, fired. I, I think, <laughs> then he came back, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> he needed to be around. Um, I think it's a fallacy that uh, um, you need to bring an operator. I think Sloopman is, is a unique situation, but I think that's not the formula for success. I think, you know, the, you bring a Sloopman in when the founders can't operate, right? That's the, his formula. 
And so that's the key to these deals is do the VCs prematurely not make the founders operators, or if the founder wants to be an operator, they got to be in a position to learn how to be one. And if they, if they, if they think they're one and they're not, that's failure. And that's when they get bounced uh, yeah. out of the company. When the ones that say, Hey, I'm not an operator. Let's bring a Frank Slootman in. That's, that's, that's the scenario or a founder that's young, Zuckerberg, hey, I want to run this company. You surround yourself with operators underneath you, supporting you. That's the key. The ones that fail, the ones that think they can operate things, and they can't. Well, wasn't know? Cheryl Sandberg, I mean, the real operator at, at, at Facebook? Or, yeah. I mean, you know that and, better than I do. But, I yeah. mean, Zuckerberg caught lightning in a bottle. And then like, the, the word is like Cheryl really managed that day to day, right? Yeah, on the business side. Um, the technical side, Cheryl didn't have anything to do with. It was Zuckerberg and Chris Cox on the team. Um, they had a good team on that side. So it was, that was a great example of divide and conquer. And that's essentially what Larry and Sergey did with Eric Schmidt. Eric Schmidt came in yeah. at the right time, and and that was controversial at the time. And they maintained that three three person team, and then Schmidt handled all the all the all the business side. Of course, Larry and Sergey were actively involved. It wasn't like was I think Zuck was letting Cheryl do her own thing, Cheryl Sandberg, with some oversight. But I think Zuck trusted her and let her run the show. And you know, some say that 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 was the the problem. <laughs> she got too successful. The advertising became too good, Dave. Yeah. It was so popular. You know, it, it broke democracy. I mean, let's face it. Facebook was so successful in their targeting that the payload of the network effect and their overall social graft infrastructure was so strong, it didn't matter what you put good content in there, it works great. You put bad content in there, it works bad, great. So, you know, it was too good. I mean, and I think Cheryl built that system. And then because the ads were paying so much, they had to look the other way. No one talks about that, but that's basically, in my opinion, what happened. They kind of knew about it. It's like, well, it won't hurt anyone. And at the scale, it's almost too big to pull back. I mean, it's really a tough call. Facebook definitely had some big problems there, and they they they, they need to pay their penance for that. But you can't blame them. I mean, they, they what are you going to do? Turn off the billions of dollars flowing in? Oh, they had a they had a, so much cash, cash coming. Oh. Mean, oh my god! And and you know that's like Microsoft back in the day. They basically had their monopoly. It was like it, it became indestructible. I mean, they earned it. You know, Bomber and and Gates obviously made the right moves, the right chess moves relative to IBM, and they kind of stole the graphical user interface moves, right? Whereas Apple never really had that sort of monopoly, right? They just made great products. You know, Dell, they didn't have a monopoly. They were basically putting together, you know, other people's components, and so that was those that was more of a business model. You know, Oracle had to fight it out with like Sybase and Informix and IBM. And so, you know, it may make interesting case studies, I guess. I don't know. Well, Dave, there's a hurricane brewing, just FYI, on uh, coming up your way. Dude, we just got hit. Like, this 45-mile-an-hour winds blew through here. It must have been like 100 lightning strikes. It was pitch black. I was like, what the hell? And then, boom, <laughs> gone. Yeah, so I guess it is headed our way. What, I mean, I just found this out. What do you know? I, mean, I don't even know. Hurricane Lee brewing down there. Oh, Christ, that's all we need. You know what else? I got, I got, um, I got to have a shout out to your your alma mater, Babson. Babson was named the number one college for uh, schools among the the Pulse twenty twenty four best colleges in the U.S. that scored the highest for career preparation in a survey of students and recent alum. Babson number one over Northeastern. Northeastern didn't make the top ten. They got the great co-op program over there. I know. I was surprised. Babson's a great school. I, I would tell everybody, you know, when I went to Babson, um, when, you, know, you know, Harvard wouldn't accept part-time students because I went to Babson part-time because I worked for Hewlett Packard in the uh, 90s, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, and they paid for my college. Um, you know, it's kind of a factoid not really, I've really talked about before, but I didn't hear I had to, but. What did you have to? Right. What did you have to give in return? You have to just sign up for some number of years. No, no. They basically would. Part of the company benefits was if you were identified as a decent performer, like I was, and you didn't have to be a superstar, but if you were like had the aptitude, and your managers and um, a certain late chain of command approved it, they pay for your education. That's and it. You didn't have to was, sign up for two years after, or no? No, I, I quit two years later. Two years later, started a search company. <laughs> 
No, they, awesome. they, they, Hewlett Packard had a philosophy, Dave, and I got the book right behind me. It's called, I keep it on my desk. It's called the HP way. And then they had a philosophy called management by walking around. And back then you'd walk around the factory floor and kind of shoot the breeze and check on things and, you know, you know, press the, press the flesh. But they, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard had a philosophy and their philosophy was train their people so that they're so strong enough that they would, that they would want, that could go out and start a company. They were very entrepreneurial at that time too. This is like insane pre-entrepreneurial bubble uh, momentum. There's like a, a wild card. No one thought like this. Every corporation was maximize the employees, you know, theory X management, they call it. But Hewlett Packard said, we want to train our people so they can go out and start their own company. And then, and people said, why would you do that? He said, well, it's our job to keep them here. And that's the philosophy of, of HP. And so they, you know, if you wanted education, you do it. So I went, I applied to Babson, that's got awesome. in Babson College, got my MBA there, obviously my undergraduate computer science at Northeastern, but they paid for it. Said, but I had to go at night, night school. Harvard had no night school. So, you know, but Harvard and Babson, the professors teach both places. So all my buddies who were at Harvard Business School. We're getting the same classes. Jeff Timmons taught entrepreneurship. Uh, Mick Stevenson taught a, a financial entrepreneurship, how to finance a growing venture. The faculty would swap back and forth. You'd compete for the Kaufman Fellowship. And so, and I, and I asked someone, why do they do that? They go, well, they get paid more at Babson. <laughs> <laughs> so they, Harvard, Harvard, prestige. Harvard, Harvard said, we don't want to lose everyone to Babson. So they let them do their side hustle at Babson. And that's how Babson got their name. They were essentially letting the Harvard professors teach uh, the Babson folks. And, you know, and a lot of Babson attracts a lot of international students yeah. that Harvard wouldn't let in. Okay. So that, that was another little kind of area that, that Babson had cornered, which is, you know, the king of this country's son goes there or, you know, royalty, you know, oil money or whatever. It was a very, very diverse school. Babson was great. I mean, I really enjoyed my time there. Um, I learned a lot about myself and entrepreneurial thinking. The curriculum was amazing. And I was totally prepared. What they didn't teach you enough of that Northeastern does is hands-on. Like you need to fall on your face in entrepreneurship. And they didn't really prepare you. They kind of say, oh, you got to fail and learn. But they didn't really highlight that enough, Dave. You say in Northeastern or Babson? Didn't Babson. You? Babson gave you all the things you need to be an entrepreneur. But they, they give too much false hope. This is the problem with all these programs. Entrepreneurship is freaking hard, right? What they don't, what they don't, what they don't <laughs> tell you is when you when, be prepared to do a face plant. It's like learning how to snowboard or ski. You know, you're not going to be great until you do a bunch of face plants, and and that's what they don't teach in school, and 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 that's hard to teach. You got to do it. Get out there and just do it. So okay, everyone always yeah. asks me, should I get my MBA? Yeah, no, get out there and and get out there and get 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 going. You know, just don't break your neck i love that uh, the bill and dave story though that's that's awesome remember we did the show at uh, the cube at bill and dave's office remember that yeah the old it 70s like, furniture yeah, like that they retained the, they had ashtrays on their desk yeah big ashtrays <laughs> right that was, that was wild oh uh, that's uh, awesome well what else, what else is going on in the news arm here? Yeah. arm 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 ipo that's what i want to get to yeah so dave so you so you're on top well first of all We've been we both and our team's been covering arms till the cows come home. You have an opinion on the valuation. What's your take on arm? Well, you know what caught my attention is in uh, Rob Hof, our editor in chief, shares notes for the week, and he quoted this guy. I guess in one of his stories, this guy from Third Bridge. I guess they're a research company, L B M N Kona, he's an analyst. Mm -hmm. He said it's a lot more challenging for ARM to capitalize on the current trend for AI than a company like NVIDIA because around 60 to 70% of ARM's revenue is derived from mobile and the AI landscape is centered around cloud-based operations rather than that's, being heavily that's integrated. That's fucking bullshit right there. Well, that's what I, so I wrote a big giant, you know, wrong. And so, oh, because, it, I mean, first of all, you know, one of the first you know uses of ai as consumer with face rec recognition right most of the innovations in the enterprise come from consumer if not yeah. all of them and i think that we, whereas much of the ai if not most of the ai today is is this guy saying modeling in the cloud the vast majority is going to be ai inferencing at the edge and i think arm architectures are going to dominate that so i mean the fundamental 
starting premise is, is not right. And then the other thing he said, Arm itself notes that generative AI poses potential risks to certain part of its business since AI models generally run on graphics card cards, not the central processing units that Arm makes. Well, Arm makes <laughs> CPUs, GPUs, NPUs, accelerators, and I think. And the other one was he noted that the other big risk to Arm is is Risk Five, already making inroads. Arm has like such a huge lead over over these other alternative architectures. I know uh, Alibaba is leaning into risk five, but so I, I just, some of that stuff I think is fundamental assumptions that are wrong. Now, having said all that, he's correct in that ARM is not growing that rapidly. Uh, and it, I, but I think this is more business model. It's got this business model where it's licensing its technologies, but it's got a, a killer, awesome platform. And it's got 10x the wafer volumes, I've said this many times, of x86. And it's volume, volume, volume. So ARM is going to win in terms of low cost. It's going to win in terms of performance, low energy. And it's going to, I think, dominate. And that's why NVIDIA uses an ARM-based architecture. That's why Amazon's yeah. using ARM-based architecture. Same thing with Microsoft and, and, and Google, which is, again, copying a lot of the moves that 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 Amazon had made with Annapurna. So I like ARM. I don't think, I think you're right. You, you alluded to my thinking that it is somewhat pricey. I think it is. Yeah. Is it worth 50 to 60 billion? Probably not with- What are, what are current comps at that level? Who's at that valuation? What's Snowflake's valuation? No, Snowflake's, you know, well under that now, you know, so 30 to 50. You know, Snow. I mean, uh, Databricks is like forty-two. What's Intel's valuation? I bet you Intel's less. Intel. <laughs> I bet you Intel's <laughs> less. I mean, Intel's value right now. No, sorry, one hundred and fifty-nine million uh, billion. One fifty-nine billion. So, so triple what ARM will yeah. be at. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, the, the problem is. They've got like. I mean, look. If ARM if ARM continues to dominate, they become standard. The numbers are going to be massive. So I think that's it's going to go it's up. It's just the, the 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 problem is it's just you know they don't make it. TSMC makes the the chips, and then the other thing is the licensees add a lot of value. So for instance, this guy said, <clears throat> you know, Risk Five making inroads in automotive. Well, Tesla is like using ARM. They basically take the CPU and 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 GPU pretty much as is, I think. And then they program the NPU because ARM is so programmable. So that's where they add value. So a lot of the value add comes from the licensee, which is such an attractive model for the licensee. Now, RISC V has got a lot of open source. You know, you yeah. could probably do something similar, but ARM volumes are so large. And basically they've taken the time to tape out, which is the time it takes to go from, you know, design to actually you got chips that you can install. From five years, ARM took them down to 18 months, maybe even 24 months. And now with the most recent announcement, their recent Neoverse announcement, their latest version, they had to take that down to nine months. You know, this is so far ahead from yeah. a time to market standpoint and a cost advantage because of rights law. So I like, I mean, it's, it's it, look, it's, they're getting more from a valuation standpoint than they would have got selling to NVIDIA. But the problem is they're a controlled company. You know, the stock's not going to be like super liquid, right? Because SoftBank still owns most of it. But I, I mean, I love ARM. I wish the U.S. government let NVIDIA buy it. The U.S. would have owned ARM instead of, you know, international ownership. But well, um, hey, we got we got it. We have to kind of break early today because i have a couple more interviews i got to do here in studio oh, but we shit, have a couple sorry, minutes i'm, I'm ranting oh no away. no uh, oh no worries it's, it's great rant arm is a super, super valuable company it's an important company and people are going to be analyzing this till 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 till, till, till for a long time but i do want to get one thing in so on and i just saw a tweet posted this morning by the founder co-founder of hugging face uh clement delong i've interviewed on the cube he's a cube alumni he he's gonna you're gonna, you're gonna like this um, he quotes, where are the open sourced AI folks in Silicon Valley? Question mark. 
hope they haven't all been brainwashed by the doomers and proprietary people. <laughs> <laughs> Period. The number one open LLM, Falcon 180B, has been trained outside of Silicon Valley. So it's time to step up. What a call yeah. out. So first of all, Falcon. first of all, First of, all, first of all, he's not really American, so his English is off. Proprietary people. I love that. My favorite line. You proprietary people, you. Um, doomers and proprietary. First of all, I love Clem. Clem, we love you. Love you to death. Cube alumni. Got to say it. Get it all wrong. Silicon Valley is not doomers and proprietary people. There are proprietary people in Silicon Valley, but that's not. That's a little bit of an over overgeneralization. Okay. That being said. He does call out Silicon Valley. And, and, you know, we have open source out here. We got JJ. He runs open source uh, VC firm, always pumping. Got an event coming up. Tons of open source in California. Tons, tons in Silicon Valley. Um, a little bit off base, a little bit of a shot across the bow, a little bit of a global rivalry developing, Dave. I want to bring this up because, one, I like Clem, but I like his point calling out Silicon Valley, even though it's a little bit over the top, brings up the global, global, global discussion. Open source is global. Entrepreneurship is now global. There's a global wave happening. And this is something that we're going to continue to talk about in our pod, probably in another episode. But the global entrepreneurship with AI is so big. Does Silicon Valley have to evolve? He's basically saying, you're behind. Step up. It's getting uh, dispersing. I, I, in I'm not sure I agree with him, but after the machine learning came out of Silicon Valley. What so, does Chambers I'm, say to you? There is no, he was in East Coast, 128, Silicon Valley took over. Silicon Valley no, took over. There is no sure thing. He had a different phrase for it. Hey, real quick, did you see Las Vegas hotel staff is going to go on strike next month, maybe? That'll suck um, with the fall conference season. Yeah, I don't get room service anyway. Yeah, well, it's supposedly <laughs> everything. <Check> Housekeepers, <laughs> bartenders. Oh, boy. You go oh to the boy. bar. Bartenders, all staff walking off the job, restaurants. So that'll really suck if that happens. So, all right, what's your rant for the week? Um, so I kind of did my rant already. I guess I guess I have another rant. I, I, I healthcare costs are going up. Hey, hey, there you go. Like supposedly going up like more than they have in the last ten years. So they're going to squeeze small businesses again, and. You know, it's just got there's something's got to give here, John. I mean, either we got to get to universal health care, or somehow we we just can't keep burdening companies with these health care costs rising with no value add. I mean, we keep making these investments in health care as as companies, and we got to what choice do you have? You got to squeeze your employees' worth, make them put up a a bigger chunk of the pie. You don't want to do that. Or you just eat it and you take it out of their pockets, or you try to pass it along to customers, which you can only do so much. So it's just, you know, I, I really think that it's a longer conversation, but I have thoughts on how to solve this problem. Less defense wow. spending, restructure Social Security and, 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 and Medicare and entitlements, and put it toward health care. Put it toward yeah. universal health care. I think and that it's never going to happen because the government doesn't have the, the, the Congress doesn't have the balls to do it. Mm -hmm. But that's the simple math equation. Cut defense, cut entitlements, you know, create universal health care. Just extend, extend Obamacare. Everybody's like, oh, Obamacare is a disaster. Well, no, the disaster is this just endless cycle that we're in yeah. and people that don't have health care. So that's my rant for the, this week. Good rant. My, What's I your guess rant? my my rant is more of an observation rant, but I, I Time Magazine just put out the um, Time 100 slash AI, the Time's most 100 most important influential people in AI. And I guess it's a quasi rant because their AI has become propped up now to be this like mainstream political thing. And, you know, I know some of the names on there, Clem from Hugging Face, you know, he's on there, right? You got a lot of leaders that I know in there. Great names, by the way. Good list. It's not comprehensive. You know, I think it's more of politically correct, you know, uh, kind of names. There could be more names in there. I mean, like Mark Andreessen, what, why is he in there? I mean, what has he done? 
he's just throwing money at people. I wouldn't say he's influential. He, Reed Hoffman, I think, may have been more on the ground. Um, there's a lot of on people that should be in here that aren't. We'll get into that list. Jensen, obviously, with NVIDIA's in there. Um, not a lot of women, you know. Guess who made it? Cube alumni, Aiden Gomez. He should be in there from Cohere, which is cool. So they kind of got a couple guys in there. Um, Clement's in there. Clem's in there from Hugging Face. Sam Altman, Deep Mind. Um, the CEO and chairman of Baidu is in there, Chinese guy. Anthropics, obviously, in there um, uh, from there. This is this is all presented by Intel, sponsored this thing, by the way, not NVIDIA. That's ironic. No one from Intel's in there. Um, you got Salesforce is in there. So it feels a little too media oriented, not enough. Um, Still sounds like a pretty good list, though, John. Oh, yeah, it's not a bad list at all. It's a great, it's a great list. I'm just saying, it's just now we're seeing the Time 100 come out with AI. I, I don't know. I guess it's to me, it's a little too early to tell. And by the way, this doesn't include the people that have been involved with AI for years. I mean, AI is now popular, but it's only because of the cloud and the things that have happened recently. The, all the tech and theories old. And there's a lot of people that have been involved in bias, AI for good, um, a lot of this stuff, neural networks that need to, I think, be, be highlighted. So I just want, it's, it's out there. It's, it's a mini rant. It's not a full rant because I'm not against lists, believe me. And, and, no, but I'm glad you brought that up. I got to check that out. That looks like an interesting list. Yeah, so that's that's it for me. The rest of my kind of rant is more, or I should say enthusiasm, is is um, how AI is just continuing to be super exciting. I think it's the fountain of youth for us older, multi-cycle industry veterans that have been around for a while um and certainly for us with the media business we have it's just great content i think entrepreneurs entrepreneurs are coming off the bench right of retirement uh, to get into ventures new young people are coming in demographics are shifting for founders it's just really one of the most exciting times in history of technology so you know um being more experienced now, I, I wish I was 25 again, like I would yeah, say, I because it really is a special time. So I always say to my, my, my kid, my four kids and friends, get in, get in the arena, get on the floor, get on the dance floor. You know, this is going to be a great party. And, you know, from an entrepreneurship standpoint, we're talking about Babson College and these other schools. You can't teach this stuff in school, executing, putting teams together, getting synergy, getting cohesion, um, product market fit is going to be even more of a, an art because Get in the arena, the, like Tom Brady, the, the acceleration of venture creation is going to be the new venture creation is going to be phenomenal. It's going to be fast and it's a new game and the, the pace of play. It's, it's, it's going to be amazing. So I'm super excited. Can't wait to look at companies, invest in them, cover them and have fun. So I, I got to say that's, that's, that's my final point, but it's all good. And again, outside right of that, Got reInvent coming up. We got CrowdStrike. I'm going to be in DC day from Google Mandy at the security show. You got. We're in Vegas next week. I'm it's, going to be in LA. SAS, I'm going to, I'm going to be in. I'm going to be in LA with Paul Martino. He's got tickets to the Eagles LA game, Rams game at the SoFi Stadium. He's going to LA. Wow, he's going to. He's traveling. Those Eagles fans travel. They're I'm crazy. Going to to, I'm going to go see my daughter in North Carolina at UNC, watch her soccer games, and then hang out for Parents Weekend, and then uh, a lot of action. Nice. A lot of action. Yeah. All right. Well, Dave, that's right, episode on the books. We'll uh, we'll wrap it up. Check us out at siliconangle.com, cube.net. See you next time.